Dr. Benalcazar is going to show us a case right now uh, using the fully integrated navigation system. And Dr. Rubin is going to show us a case where I think you're just using fluoro on that case. That's all. Just yeah. fluoro. And so it is entirely possible to do this procedure with any of, of those modalities. Like Dr. Benalcazar said, the target is fairly robust. And once you get comfortable with the anatomy and recognize wh what your target is, you, um, you, you, you know, quickly realize that this is a, a pretty straightforward and slick operation. So let's look at Hugo's uh, procedure. Okay, we'll start this out here and try not to bore everyone. This is uh, not typically a spectator sport. So who is this patient, Dr. Benalcazar? So this is a patient who already had a, a unilateral SI joint fusion after uh, suffering trauma to her pelvis. Uh, we fixed the uh, side that was most symptomatic, and then uh, afterwards, uh, she was uh, she was scheduled to have uh, the opposite side done. So, on the imaging studies, you'll see her uh, pre-existing uh, uh, Rialto implants. Right now, what I'm doing is uh, palpating the edge of the uh, PSIS, the posterior iliac crest. Uh, out laterally. If uh, I don't know if the cameras can see this or not, but essentially we've got the uh, pelvis here, and I am following the PSIS uh, uh, anteriorly and laterally as far away from midline where uh, uh, we're closer to midline where uh, my operation is going to take place. Well, Once you're, I you're doing this to place the <laughs> perk pin, right? Yes, this is the perk pin uh, to allow the um, reference frame to be placed for use with the O-arm navigation. And this just goes uh, uh, about a centimeter uh, deep into the cortex. We'll attach the uh, reference frame to that and then do what we call the spin, which is the uh, CT data acquisition. So uh, the, 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 the CT scanner also uh, known as the arm, actually comes into the operating room and encases yeah, the patient. Yeah, you'll see a picture of it um, in, in just a second. I also uh, want you to notice that I'm uh, placing the pin out laterally so that if I had decided to do a bilateral approach to the SI joint, that's something that uh, we could have done uh, very easily. But how long does that take to just go through that process of the CT scanner and then uh, loading it into the computer, the stealth system. It's uh, it's very short. We actually uh, leave the room. We'll be out in the hall, and then we'll be called back in. I don't know, a, about a yeah, a couple of minutes. Doctor Benavazar, do you do you wear lead during let me, your navigating uh, let me procedures? Put, uh, thank you for pausing that. No, we don't wear we don't wear any lead. There's no reason to wear lead uh, because um, the uh, the, the only um, energetic part of the imaging uh, takes place when uh, the team isn't in the room. So um, be be before Dr. Benalcazar makes his incision here, I'll, I'll just describe the landmark. Uh, very familiar anatomy. The patient is straight prone. The, uh, I, I use a, a Wilson frame or a, or a um, laminectomy frame. Um, and uh, the incision is is about six or seven centimeters lateral to the midline, and is just below where you would make an incision for an L5-S1 discectomy. And that, that, that's almost always where uh, you can feel the, the PSIS. And even on pretty big people, if you mash around, you, you can feel it. But six or seven centimeters laterally, and the bigger they are, the more lateral you have to go because you're going to have to have a longer trajectory. Could yeah, you, you comment on the lower left uh, picture? And I, I want to reference specifically the, uh, the area in which you went into the ilium. And it's, it's not really on the very top, is it? No, it's not. It's, uh, this, now, this is just the beginning of the video here where we're planning. And uh, what we're looking at here is uh, sort of an oblique coronal view of the sacroiliac joint in this plane. This is uh, superior, this is inferior here, okay, and it correlates with the plane that we're cutting it right here. Um, so we're, we're not on the tip, we're right off the tip. And of course, this is one slice, so this appears to be a tip. It's not, it's a ridge that runs, uh, you know, all the way along. So this is very strong. I had someone 
mentioned to me that wasn't I afraid that this tip might fracture off or something like that. It just it's never happened, and, and looking at the anatomy, it's just not something that I think would be likely to happen. Um, the other thing um, to look at is in the upper right corner here at this uh, live video is the general, now this isn't exactly where we go, but it's the very general idea of the location of the Rialto implant, the trajectory of it. If you take a look at it here, we are sort of in a trajectory that's very familiar to all spine surgeons, and that is the placement of an L5 pedicle screw. Can I, can I borrow that mouse for a minute? Sure. Um, on, on, this, um, on this image here, you can see the musculature on this CT. You can see the paraspinous musculature pretty obviously right here. You can see the posterior superior iliac spine here, and you can see the gluteal muscul musculature right here. And so we're in this, this little dead space where there's no muscle, so it's, it's skin, fat, bone. So we're not going to destroy any of the muscle, the no. gluteal tissue. No, we shouldn't. So here I am, basically just, I, what I'm doing is looking for a spot here where I can put my first implant, giving myself enough space to put the second implant. I want to cross the joint in a particular area here. I want to uh, capture enough of the... Uh, iliac bone and capture enough of the uh, sacral alar bone as well. And so that's, that's kind of what I'm, what I'm doing here. I think we've got this sped up a little bit. But at some point, what we'll do is use the O-Arm software to place a plan or a virtual, um, I don't know, a virtual K-wire, if you will. And you'll see that plan as a hollow colored box that will show up in just a second. And that will represent where the first implant is going to go. So there it is there. It's very, very light. I'm sorry, it's hard to see. It will stay uh, where, we, where we place it, so to speak. And then I can uh, plan for the second implant next to that. Similar trajectory. You can see over here, this is a real-time live trajectory. Then I'm just putting a little bit of local anesthetic. We'll use the 15-bladed knife to make a small incision, probably a less than two centimeter incision. Uh, through which we can work. This is our um, sharp tap and that's going to help us. It's powered so that we don't need to pound it with a mallet. You saw the size of that mallet. Now is that, is that likely to rip uh, gluteal muscle? No, not at all. There's no muscle there. What we're going to, we will be uh, sort of uh, thrashing through some fat, but that's about it. In uh, some patients, if uh, there starts to be contact with that and the dermis, uh, with the tap in the dermis, then you just need a little bit of a bigger incision. But here we don't have any, any of that problem. You would have seen the skin pull if that were an issue. Uh, and we're following our track down across the sacroiliac joint. By the way, you can feel the uh, cortices as you pass through them. And, and that's very, very helpful. Wait, one see, probably worth pointing out right now is that the, the fourth cortex, the most the ventral... Pause that, please. The, the ventral cortex of the ala is sacral ala is very thin. And if there is a risk in this procedure, it's plunging into the pelvis. And that's why the, the, the system comes with, with very robust depth stops. And, and you must use the depth stop because the, the cortex ventrally is very, the fourth cortex you never want to go through. Yeah, ne and nevertheless, you're still going to feel that. I think we have a question. So Dr. Nafzar, just a, a procedural question. Regardless of whether navigated or by fluoro, is there a need to compress this joint? And can the system do that if there is a need to compress it? I haven't found a need to compress uh, the joint. And I'll let uh, Carter or uh, David answer the second part. This is not a uh, diarthroidal joint. You do not have a cup and a ball. And you can't, there's no reason to compress it. This is a joint that uh, is uh, undulating from superior to inferior, from anterior to posterior. It has concavities. It has convexities. They are not in the same plane. So all you have to do is stabilize it from motion. That two to four millimeters of uh, uh, the word I think they use is nutation, which really mm -hmm. means um, nodding or rocking. Rocking, you yeah. know. And, um, and once you've done that, the patient's the pain's gone, period. A, a, lot, done. a lot of patients feel like that they can tell when they're in or out. And um, I, I believe them. I don't know what it is. I can't visualize it, but they say they're in or out. And they say, Doc, how do you know whether you're going to bolt me together when I'm in or out? 
It's my belief that placing the patients prone with, with, with pelvic support, I mean, no matter how you place somebody prone on an operating table, they have a lot of pressure uh, ventrally on their pelvis. I think that reduces them to a neutral position, and that's part of the reason that, that we're getting good results with this. And I think they're going to be um, stabilized in the same plane, whether it's right or left. Uh, I'd like to think that uh, what's on the right side is on the left side, but maybe one's more unstable. But placing in a prone position, you're actually locking uh, the ilium to the sacrum in its, uh, in, in its sweetest spot. Totally agree. And, yeah. and that's what we're doing. Are there, are there any best practices when it comes to patient positioning that you look for? And can you elaborate on that, if you would? Well, this uh, patient here is on a flat Jackson table, primarily to allow the O-arm to go around it. Um, is there any reason to use a, a Jackson table? Uh, no, not, not other than the imaging qualities of it. Um, the uh, patient is uh, placed on a pad um, across the, um, across the uh, anterior pelvis, and that really is just, uh, that really is just the only, other than uh, the patient being prone and padded, that's really the only uh, different uh, thing that we would do. So very much, very similar to setting up a patient uh, with preserved lordosis, for a lumbosacral fusion. I really don't think there's much of a difference. Dr. Rubin? I think that's balance. It's an intrinsic balance. We're going to uh, you know, delve in, in the next couple of years of making sure that not only our patients have adequate balance lordosis based on pelvic incidence, we're also going to understand uh, the, uh, the dynamics of uh, pelvic rotation as it relates to the uh, flat floor. We're going to understand and delve into keeping patients with, uh, who have flexion deformities in their hips. And this is all going to be considered, but in this particular position, in a prone position, you're locking, again, symmetrical pelvic wings to the sacrum, and you're doing it in a way that is reproducible, and it's a very stable, structural, functional position. The, the one, there is a pitfall that I, I think is worth pointing out for the, the surgeons in the audience spine surgeons in the audience. What you don't want to do is position some patients on the Jackson table and some patients on a laminectomy frame because the, the uh, angle of the sacrum changes dramatically from a laminectomy frame where, it's, where the sacrum is relatively flat to, uh, to a Jackson spine table where the sacrum <coughs> falls, sometimes as much as 45 degrees. And so the... the um, the trajectory that the surgeon will observe is dramatically different between those two positionings of the patient. And, and if you have staff that is variable and changing, and when the staff sometimes positions them one way and sometimes positions them the other, you could get confused. So I, I would say be very conscious that the patient is positioned the same way every time so you get to uh, feel for the trajectories. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so let's move forward here. Before you move forward, are there any uh, pathways that you would take uh, in viewing abnormal uh, anatomy, whether that be dysmorphic anatomy or uh, sacralized L5 or anything like that that, they, that the audience should take into consideration when considering whether to even do a procedure? When you have a, a, a sacralization of L5, uh, so-called Bertolotti syndrome, um, then everything's off. The anatomy is not, quote, normal, although who's got a normal anatomy? But the vascularity, the neurologic positions in the front of the pelvis are all off and all different. And that's why I personally uh, demand of the people that we train at our facility that a, um, an angio CT is done or an angio MRI, something that tells us where the anatomy is because the uniqueness of the sacrum and the uniqueness of L5 is really different. And you need to know that you have enough um, uh, sacral alar uh, bone, and you need to know what you're walking into. You don't, you don't ever go into a gunfight without all the guns cocked and ready to go. So you, you don't have, you cannot walk into any surgery blind. Everybody's different, and they should be treated differently as, as we know they're supposed to be. So you need to know what's going on. In the interest of time, um, I, I want to make sure we get to Dr. Rubin's um, surgery. Let, let's continue, Dr. Benalcazar. 
Okay, so uh, here what we've done is basically measured backwards from the tip to uh, give us an idea of how long of an implant that we're going to use. That's what you see there. These are the implants here. We've chosen the middle uh, size implant, which is 50 millimeters. We're packing it now. And you're packing that with graft on, I see. Yes. That's Medtronic's preferred pairing right now with this, with this product. It's on label. Uh, demineralized. Right here what I'm doing uh, is removing the uh, tap. I've left it in just because I don't want the bone uh, to bleed. We've, uh, we have now a large hole that represents the trajectory through the small incision. Um, because of the navigation, I can line that up beautifully on the first shot. And basically just using a uh, hand torque, I'm going to bring that implant all the way down across the joint. Uh, the one thing I would say is take a look at my uh, wrist and as I cross the uh, cortices, you may see a little bit uh, more effort on my part up oh, the right uh, there. The, yeah. And then as we get to the very bottom, the anterior alar cort uh, cortex, you're going to see me start to struggle as I as I as I bring that implant right up against that anterior cortex. Not not across it, but right up against the anterior cortex. This this implant really has wonderful purchase, doesn't it's it? It's beautiful. It really does. Here it is where I'm just just little tiny forward uh, torques just to get it right up against that anterior cortex. Okay, and that's the only reason I included that in this video, just to show you that I compliment you that. because the implant is not proud uh, and proximal or distal. It's sitting perfect. Thank Being you. impressive. The, um, on, a, on average, it's a 50 millimeter implant. Some some bigger people need 60s, and, and some smaller people need 40s. But the majority are 50 in my practice. What about you guys? Uh, yeah, it also depends on the trajectory. You can find a trajectory here where you can use a 60 on just about anyone. Uh -huh. um, but I prefer this trajectory, and I agree with you. It's about 50. Do you try to replicate in all three dimensions? the two implants, because we do put two implants in, uh, or do you at least hope or design that one of the three uh, directions, either it's uh, lateral, coronal, or whatever, uh, is different than the already indwelling implant? Um, I, 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 I like the implants not to be completely parallel. I like them to cross the sacroiliac joint in a not perpendicular way. I think in that way, number one, we are um, canceling out uh, more vectors of force across that joint. And number two, we're creating a cross-section that's oval and therefore larger um, rather than in a perpendicular cross-section. It's going to be round and therefore smaller than an oval. Okay, so um, that's, what's, that's what I'm doing here. I don't particularly spend any time trying to get them lined up perfectly. Here's the second one coming in. Sorry. Uh, sure, I was just going to make a joke and say that, yeah, that I wish I could get them exactly parallel, but that never seems to be a problem. Yeah. Mm, it's not. How, how long, can I have to ask, um, how long did this take you skin to skin, do you think? Once the scan, not excluding the scans. Uh, the excluding the scans? Um, it's going to be a, um, you know, five to seven minute uh, procedure. That's awesome. Yeah, there's the second implant. I'm ready to uh, sign in. up. <laughs> okay, we're taking that out, and that, that's the end of the operation there. So then it's just a skin closure. Yeah, the skin closure is a, uh, is a single uh, uh, 2 ovicral uh, into the dermis, and then glue. And again, we're talking, in this particular case, I think our incision is about, you know, a centimeter and a half, two centimeters. Basically, just big enough for that tap to fit through. Well, nicely done. Thank you. Thank you.